Okay, so today we are discussing love. What is love? And um, we'll mostly concentrate on attachment theory and social cognitive neuroscience, but I will start, of course, with, with psychoanalysis as the main enemy. So the, the problem, as always, <laughs> the first thing, that the problem with, um, with, psycho, uh, with psychoanalysis is that it defines um, love and it's basically based on the idea of, of sexuality. And this is more or less how we still probably perceive um, perceive ourselves, but not only who we are, not only our gender and uh, sexual orientation through those concepts, but also it defines our, this perspective defines our interconnectivity. And that's the worst. So it's kind of captured, captures the, the discourse of sexuality, captures the, um, not only who we are, but also the way we are connected. Because the the primal since uh, psychoanalysis since what psychoanalysis articulated the primal way of how we are connected intimacy our intimacy we we define through uh, sexuality like as the real the real thing and what really really want from each other maybe it changed already hopefully and i'll try to change it today I'm already trying to change it so to decolonize the uh, intimacy from the discourse of, of sexuality and including decolonize the materiality of love because when we think about the phys physical aspect of love the physical aspect of proximity like when we are kissing or touching each other or whatever licking each other we define it as sexual so for us this is the sign of of our sexuality as the which is based, unfortunately, on heterosexual normativity. So the materiality of love, the basis of love, its physical aspect is reduced to sexuality. And the question for you, how would you define, how you think Freud would define love? We already know about it. And uh, luckily, Vladislav is not here today, and he will not give us a complicated answer to that. Yummy. Yeah, well, as a sublimation of of sexual pleasure. Yeah, a sublimation of sexual pleasure. Well done. Well, we know from Alenka Zupancic and Vladislav, who help us a lot with her, that. Um, it's not exactly the sublimate, maybe in contemporary psychoanalysis, it's not defined as a sublimation of a sexual instinct because those concepts of drives that uh, Freud introduced are different from, from um, instincts. But uh, we still, according to uh, those, some of the other readings, um, we can still see in Freud, and according to Freud himself, of course, we can easily find. Uh, that he really do reduces it to the um, love and proximity and uh, what we really want from each other to like sexual instinct and sexuality in the most common sense, not in a, some psychoanalytic like an uh, fancy sense, the way it was redefined. And the, the, the problem with psycho psychoanalysis and it was my background as well that it proclaims itself that the proper psychoanalysis starts with 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 the claim uh, with statement that um, sexuality, the sexual drive, is the basis. So, <laughs> the, the, if you, you know, the problem with me is that uh, to still con to consider yourself to be a part of psychoanalytic. Uh, tradition you have to start with it <laughs> all i do is just trying to avoid the trying to just i can't even start okay but i have my, i developed the whole theory out of that I'm not sure it's still psychoanalysis so we can really see that's true yummy it, it starts from sublimation starts from the love as, as sexual desire and then it goes sublimated into something more refined cultural form and this is what we call love and uh, for example we can see in uh, in Freud there's the same work where he claims that uh, psychoanalysis 
to mute some of these. Where's the question? Okay, so um, the same work where he claims that um, is he, he based on his theory on Plato and the, uh, he that his idea of sublimation that Plato already stated it, probably we develop kind of an alternative understanding of Plato that it's not sublimation or maybe alternatively you can see it as not as a sublimation. So Freud really claims that all kinds of love, mm, uh, including self-love and friendship and love for humanity even, and what is most of us, uh, most important for us here is love for parents and children. Uh, all of them are based on this basic normative heterosexual desire, which is um, expression of the same instinctual impulses of sexuality and um, it is sexual love with a sexual union as its as its aim so um, we will mostly concentrate on love for parents and children but you, you can all also if you want to we can also derive to uh, similar sorts uh, starting from any of those kinds of law. Maybe self-love is the, the hardest one, but still. So all of those kinds of law, uh, including law for parents and children, which I have most questionable for me, it starts from the, from the basic sexual desire, which is, appears within the pair of um, male, female, and it's aimed on sexuality. And Donald Winnicott, uh, explained amazingly in what way Freud, also he believed in the same thing, the way Freud, here he explains the way Freud see uh, children. So what, are, what what is sexuality of children? Do you understand what it means that children are all dressed up with, with nowhere to go? How Freud explains, how this explains Freud's understanding of, of what is child. We were talking about it. I mute you, so if you want to talk, you have to unmute yourself, or raise your hand. Yummy, any ideas? Because I can see you in the only person I can see currently. No? Well, I I have an idea, I don't know if it's correct, but um, yeah, well, uh, parent, they used to, I don't know, dress their children up and we can ask the question why they do that. So maybe for their own pleasure. <laughs> yeah, it's less complicated, than that, but it's interesting as well. Thank you. So the idea is that children are, have all the equipment because they're born with a sexual instinct, but they are not able to reproduce yet. So this is why for Freud, their, their sexuality is perverted. And um, so they can feel... Um, sexual desire for their parents, for their caregivers, but they it's perverted because they can't uh, reproduce yet. So they want it, but they are all dressed up, but with, with nowhere to go yet. And then um, it's, it's, uh, it's stopped to be, uh, stops to be perverted once, once they can actually reproduce. So now it's normal. And, but still we can see that starting point for Freud why it's perverted uh, sexuality of child because um, because the normativity for him is still in the, inside the pair of uh, male female where male plays the the active role within the within this kind of sexuality so mm, yeah and so we can see that the pair of of caregiver and child uh, he uh, explains as a deviation from this initial uh, initial uh, initial couple of male female that is based on sexuality children in a sense that their sexuality is perverted it's not normal yet they have it it defines their behavior but it's not normal so it's deviation even though from something that will happen later which kind of doesn't make any sense because how it can be deviated from something that will happen later and not the contrary yeah, but doesn't matter in this stage. 
So children are perversion uh, in relation to normal sexuality, if you consider it as a, as a basis of definition. And uh, on the other hand, we were discussing this a bit too, and that attachment of a caregiver to a child is also seen as, as some kind of transformation of this initial desire, sexual desire that exists within um, adult female male couple. So the way Freud defines um, the uh, attachment of mother to a baby, he claims that uh, the person in charge of a baby, which is uh, often a mother, uh, treats a baby uh, so the the feeling that she the feeling something that she feels for the baby is has has its roots its roots in her sexual life right in her uh, relationship and her feeling towards the towards a man uh, whatever she do all those physical uh, manifestation of love when she kisses baby and rocks baby those are um, function as a substitute for a complete sexual object and complete sexual object is penis and mother would be horrified if she'll find out that all she does all the tenderness and that she feels towards the towards the child has its roots in the sexuality this is why for freud she um, kind of uh, trying to repress those feelings so never recognize it yeah and uh, but this is what she called pure love, uh, mother-child love. But for real, for Freud, Freud knows that it's not pure, that it's all derived, just the deviation of basic, unpure sexual love uh, to uh, of a woman, mother to, uh, to a male. So, and the, the concept of uh, the tenderness is very important here. I'll probably discuss it a bit later. So this is the term that he, Freud uses to define mother-child love. And uh, he will also claim that, uh, well, that this is the deviation. So this tenderness or foundness, it's not just the tenderness because this, this kind of tenderness can be also violent. And just when we found of someone, when we need first proximity of, of someone, it can be physical as well. Because when mother kisses the baby, it's physical manifestation of love too. So you see what is what is happening here. And also, yeah, Freud claimed that the feminine situation is only established if the wish for a penis is replaced by one or for a baby. We were discussing it a lot because it's my problem. Uh, so yeah, this is how he see the for the formation of a female uh, psycho psych psychology, female. Uh, female psyche, claiming that uh, what drives female woman is the desire for penis and from the young age, uh, girls feel that there is something wrong with them because they discover they don't have pen penis and uh, this is, they desire penis and then they, they have a baby as a substitution for the desire of penis and this is how they start to be women. This is what they find. So it's very weird because in, in the pair of mother and child there is because uh, like Karen Horning claimed that it's a womb envy because mother uh, mothers play more maybe according to her more important role in reproduction the men envy to this reproductive function of woman and this is why they either try to reappropriate mother function like we saw for example one of the interpretation of uh, Asian Greek uh, processes uh, of uh, pederastia, right? The phenomenon of pederastia when men were trying to play the role of woman to substitute a woman, claiming that it's more important than just raise physical children and that they are mothers, but kind of better mothers because they, they do the same, they perform the same function of education, of um, formation of a child, taking care of a child, but in like more important sphere, which is cultural sphere. So, uh, can also be interpreted as the as the womb envy, right? So, and here in Freud, we see that the mother-child couple 
somehow it's not about men at all. I mean, it is about men in, in, in a way, but <laughs> to the idea that it's all based from the mother's side and from the child's side, somehow on sexuality it, from, for mother is a deviated, um, redirected uh, desire for man, desire for penis from early stage and to later in life. And for baby, it's perverted, not yet normal, a feeling of sexuality, which is and normat sexual normativity for Freud, it's a uh, adult ma male and his sexual desire. So it's very weird that he actually it's possible to introduce the male as a center in inside of inside here, and um, it's still based on this for us now because, as I said, that when we when we think about love uh, and when we want to be kind of realistic we um this realistic the idea that we are realistic means that it's all about sex it's at the basis it's um, it's sexuality it's this desire of um, yeah desire for sex and even the the current um, the current discourse of um uh, where when we scared that uh, we will cross the border of um um, of sexuality do something inappropriate with a child so it, it wasn't like this uh, all the time in history we used to perceive a child for example uh, children playing with their uh, sexual organs of each other it didn't perceive it was in certain period of history it wasn't perceived as not normal even children uh, uh, jokes about their uh, they children having sex between each other like in in the age of of five uh, were not like in before 17th century it wasn't a big deal it was just a joke innocent joke but um, now somehow maybe because we really see um, that uh, we really base our thinking on Freud understanding of sexuality that it's always there and that parent sexuality, it's deviated kind of sexuality. So we can also, um, we, can al we can always kind of um, mm, end up, right, crossing the border, end up at this basis, which is the, the tenderness and the pure love is just deviation to, right? So within this perspective, uh, it also forms our, our current discourse of what, what are children that the idea that uh, mother instinct mother feelings uh, are based have this sexual sexual nature and also the psychoanalysis as such the latest psychoanalysis for example uh, julia kristeva julia kristeva she also claims that um, that we have to emancipate a mother's sexuality we have to admit that it's erotic that um, it is something sexual. It's not enough to proclaim like Freud does that uh, sexuality of infant, of children are, is uh, present, that children are sexual beings, but we have to also, it would be provocative kind of cool thing to admit that mother's uh, love to a child is also sexual, but it, it still doesn't help, right? It's still in, inscribing the mother. So following this Freud perspective, uh, inscribing the mother within the scope of sexuality where a male plays an a initial role and her sex sexuality is just a deviation and substitution for for desire of penis so it might be cool but it's it's not, <laughs> might not be cool so um, also so for freud this caregiver child uh, attachment is based on sexuality and this means that the very basis uh, is that caregiver child couple is derivative of a male female couple in different ways for, for, for a child, even as it's a daughter and a mother, it's still somehow about a man for both of them. It's somehow about the man. And, um, the, the trick is why this this concept is so strong and hold on it holds uh, so uh, steadily within our interpretation is it's tricky because uh, Freud claims that we um, the very position of psychoanalysis actually claims that Freud uh, yes the idea um, what is uh, father's love 
to a child. Yeah, father love. I mean, according to Freud, he um, he he talks only about mostly about mother's love, but uh, which is this deviation of of uh, initial desire for a man. But for father figure is just a figure of protection, and uh, for him the male love is the so he associates this uh, tenderness uh, as um, as infantile uh, infantile. Uh, form of sexuality as not developed uh, form of sexuality and he claimed that if a woman shows uh, too much tenderness uh, this is the uh, in sexuality this is the hysterical symptom means her, she is not ready for sexual life and she is uh, she is kind of um, un, not developed yet it doesn't coincide uh, with the with demands of sexuality and you, you can see from here that male love is when you suppress uh, suppress the, the 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 tenderness kind of and for freud he tries to define the father figure as first father figure but it's some someone who is maybe uh, taking care of a child but mostly the child is um, the power the figure of power right not the figure of tenderness the figure of tenderness is a mother so yeah and they are not not equal in this although maybe that's how the power works it has to be deprived of this tenderness so the the <laughs> trick the trick was with psychoanalysis that it in the trick with psychoanalysis that it proclaims that it kind of knows the truth so what is real and uh if we if we contradict if we claim that for example tenderness is not the that our love to a child is the pure love is not a deviation from uh, desire to a man the psychoanalysis would just claim that this is something that it's not culturally mm, tolerated and we just oppress or suppress the, this this feeling this uh, this understanding and this trick is not only about uh, love it's uh, not only about mother love but about other kinds of other kind of stuff and this is how it uh, sometimes um, establishes it itself within the discourse proclaiming that if you think in a different way it just uh, it just depression yes we're trying to suppress the the real thing and and we we, we think about our it actually works on the everyday level because what whether we think that it's uh, it's not about sex or something we think we, we tend to think that we are not realistic we are too romantic or something like that and if you want to look at the continuum of reproduction once again i promise i'm not going to show it next time so it's it's all starts from the inter intercourse you can see that uh, all the rest from here this last three ones uh, nourishment, uh, taking care, and uh, giving birth, pregnancy. All those I see seeing as um, derived from first two, one that are associated with male. And uh, for female, this nourishment, for, for mother, this nourishment of a child is seen as a deviation from her desire of intercourse with a male. But this doesn't make any sense because uh, it all start for, like for each person it all start from here and here from birth and nourishment right so the woman and men any human being it doesn't matter of a gender once were children and they were nourished by someone they were physically given birth right that was physical contact and nourishment presupposes physical contact even if it's not breastfeeding but just taking care it's it's physical so uh, we have experience of this this is the our initial basic physical experience of proximity with other here where we start and it's more logical to start from here and say that our desire for intercourse or wherever it just the mm, including for for a woman it, it just the deviation of this or the, not the deviation but we just um, employ or use this our basic experience of proximity with of uh, experience of proximity with others um, for the late later in our adult life and for freud it somehow starts from the desire start from desire for intercourse and then everything else nourishment and 
everything starts from sex. The woman is born out of desire for intercourse, out of, out of somehow has, has to do with something has, that has to do with, with the penis. But it's more uh, logical. If we start from the birth and uh, whatever mother caresses her child, whatever mother kisses her child, it's not the deviated, uh, like it's weird to consider it to be a deviated uh, feeling of desire for a male and substitution for desire of penis since it's all started from the birth. She already before kissing someone, before desiring men, if, it ha if this happens, she already had the experience of being kissed by her mother or being caressed by her mother. So like she forgot totally after having sex and then she just started to exist and her situ situation as the woman started to exist once she feels a sexual desire. So including for a child, the child starts from uh, if someone is giving birth to them, not, and, but for Freud, child, child starts as an um, underdeveloped uh, adult who is defined through the sexual desire. So it's also uh, not chronological. I'm not saying that it's supposed to be chronological, but it's like unchronological, too much not chronological. But actually Freud is um, not only our enemy, but he's also our friend, especially in his uh, earlier work. He defined, um, he, he defined the there are two currents of love. So tender current of love and sensual current of love. The tender current of love that he is the one that he um, that he defined as uh, this idea of uh, third lichai. So it's it's tender, it's foundness, it's the warm feeling of when you found when you long when you're longing for proximity, including uh, sex, including physical proximity with uh, with someone. So initially, in Freud theory, we can see this hypothesis that first, uh, what child has towards the uh, develops towards the um, caregiver is the tender current of of love uh, that is uh, including desire for for uh, physical proximity, and only later sensual desire, which is erotic desire, get kind of admixed uh, into this more uh, basic tender current. But later, unfortunately, he switched to his other theory, uh, other duality, uh, where we have, uh, where he has the idea of um, the duality of sexual instinct and uh, instinct of aggression. But th this duality was a bit more, more romantic and uh, it, it, it contradicts his idea of uh, sexuality at the center that he will start to later employ universally like everywhere and precisely if we start to develop his um, this idea this uh, initial hypothesis that uh, Freud didn't develop later it'll actually will make more sense and there are people who based uh, the theories um, on this like for example as the attachment theory now. John Bowlby, the theorist uh, who in, uh, was one of the first, the first one, uh, he was psychoanalyst and uh, psychologist, psychiatrist. And in 70s, he was uh, the one who started to develop attachment theory, the theory about the uh, physiological tendency to seek closeness to another person. So John Bowlby idea was to, um, to see a mother-child bond uh, in its own uh, as independent mechanism, uh, independent physiological, biological mechanism that uh, developed, uh, was developed and selected within the process of evolution uh, to, um, to make sure that uh, children will stay safe, that children will be uh, taken care of. So children get attached infants get attached to their caregiver, not necessarily mother, just someone who provides the care. And um, adults have also have the idea, the, uh, the ability to respond uh, to the uh, infant's need, some, not only infant's need, but other people needs to uh, be taken care of. And um, so Bowlby's idea was to go back uh, to uh, Freud's initial theory and to see um, 
this attachment that we, we might call the tenderness and longing as the self-sufficient, not as uh, derived from sexuality, but a self-sufficient phenomenon. And um, later, in, for this, only through this perspective, uh, he claimed that we can actually um, understand care, caregiver child uh, bond as a, a self-sufficient phenomenon. Only from this perspective, we can uh, we can start to describe it as something self-sufficient, not as a deviation from in Freudian sense. And um, for Bowlby, a very important idea is that uh, child, human child is born under uh, undeveloped, like really uh, undeveloped because children, human children require a lot of time, a lot of care. They can't work for, for a couple of years. They can eat unprocessed food. Um, and they require the substantial amount of care. And for this, uh, to provide this care, we have to actually have some mechanisms uh, in psychological mechanism to, that enables us to take care of someone, to, to, um, uh, so that someone would be so important for us that we are ready to sacrifice uh, ourselves. And it's, uh, it's hard to, to understand how this can be uh, based on sexuality. Uh, it, the sexuality, the physical sexuality, you will talk about it later, can be admixed to it, but it's hard to see it as, um, even in adult relationship, it's hard to see it as, sec as a central. So he claims, John Bowlby claims that the propensity to make strong emotional bonds to a particular individual is basic component of human nature. So he talks, uh, and this is the situation, our initial experience, when we need someone, when we long in for someone, when we get, when we get attached to uh, other person. And this is how we develop our ability to, to get attached to others. So it's not only about children. And according to Bowlby, uh, well, this is our basic mechanism. And also he claims that, not he, the Donald Winnicott, again, the one who was talking about the children who are all dressed up with nowhere to go. So he explains this position, uh, this position of Bowlby, uh, the attachment theory, by claiming that there is no such thing as baby. Do you have any idea what does it mean? In, in terms of attachment theory, that children are attached to their caregivers and caregivers are attached to children. What does it mean that there is no such thing as a baby? Yami, yeah, I can see you. <laughs> no? Okay, we can also say that there is no such thing as a mother and there is no such thing as an individual even adult individual. So there is no such thing as a baby uh, means that the baby is only a baby in relation to a mother uh, to a, or a caregiver. If there is no one, the baby is someone who is taken care of. There is no baby. If no one is taken care of a baby, the baby would not, would not survive. It will not exist. So what makes the baby baby um, is the is the other part of the of the bond is the caregiver so baby means someone who we take care of there's supposed to be someone there's supposed to be other part of this of at least a pair of people uh, it can't be baby by itself it's, it's not only about baby we'll talk later that it's about individual as such it's always defined as in proximity to others we just got used to think that this got used to the illusion that we are separate beings even babies, it's like a separate, if you leave it alone, it'll, it'll be even better. <laughs> no annoying parents. But it's not true because those are, um, babies require to be uh, taken care of. And so according to Bowlby, children are born uh, with already ability to get attached to someone. So when they have, uh, when they will need, uh, have some, they do have needs, they, they need to be satisfied and they um, get attached to, uh, to someone who is taking care of them and uh, they, uh, 
for example, cry if they are hungry, and cry means that they are calling for force for this person to uh, to help them. And uh, from the other side, from the side of the person who is taking care of the baby, we can also see um, we can also see the response, the uh, ability to take care of uh, of a child. And uh, for Bowlby, this this the, this was the mechanism that was aut uh, autonomously selected within the course of of evolution. It's not the deviation of a sexual desire, but it appeared as self sufficient uh, self sufficient phenomena. And this is why we can actually get attached to to other people. It's more about this um, attachment than about sexual longing and also some people i think you have this article listed uh, this paper listed in your readings and uh, cindy hazan and philip shaver claim that it's not only about mother child or care caregiver child attachment but it's also within what we call a romantic love we can also see um, Karina, did you want to say something? Okay. So within the uh, adult relationship, we can also see that it re it resembles the basic um, the basic phenomena of uh, children attachment because we have uh, yeah well this long longing to other we have separation and distress when we are separated from someone who we attach to we feel. Uh, stress, we feel longing for them. And uh, so in, in basic points, the way we define the romantic love is uh, is very similar to maybe coincide with the attachment attachment process. And uh, therefore they conceptualize it as um, adult romantic love as the, as, um, de as derived from the initial attachment of mother child uh, or caregiver child born. Yes, Daria. Uh, does attachment theory say something about unhealthy relationship? For example, when the one doesn't uh, take care, but some, ki uh, some kind of abuse happens and the other one is attached? Yeah, it says a lot about it, and especially Maybe it doesn't say that yet. It says a lot because it's already a time uh, starting from 70s where this popular psychology type uh, started to, when psychology started to be a popular thing. And, and so including Winnicott and, uh, and including Bowlby, they were in popular psychology, they mostly exist within this discourse that uh, we need non-abusive relationships or that you need to provide the proper care of a child, otherwise the child will be not uh, unhealthy. It's mostly concentrated on um, mm, this normativity, the, the normalization of relationship that uh, we need to provide a lot of love for a child. And if you do some mistake, it will, uh, uh, will cause some bad consequences for a later child development. And this is how the, it makes psychoanalysis really strong in that sense, because what you do on psychoanalytic sessions, you mostly complain uh, now how your parents uh, traumatize you. And you, the funny thing is that uh, each person, if you if you think about it, uh, you can actually good enough. You can actually find this feeling of uh, childhood love, uh, the the longing for love as and unsatisfied. So I, I'm sure each of you, if you think about it, you feel that you were um, not loved enough, it, the parents could do better. And that's the trick because you can al always find it in in your parents, in any attachment actually, that it's not enough. But the thing is that, so it's kind of start to be popular through this tendency because it's always uh, possible to discover that it's not enough, it, no matter how much, it's still not enough. And maybe not today, maybe tomorrow uh, we can talk about it because um, the, the thing is that this need is unsatisfiable need. So we can't satisfy it to the end. It's like 
you can imagine that uh, evolution for just in case program that it's all program as that this longing is always too much like then because it's too, we um so we need the whole thing of a person we need the whole thing of a mother and we can't have this whole thing even um even if they want to give us the whole thing on themselves it's still impossible this is why the love it's always traumatic and we can we can think of course about different levels uh, like distinguish abuse uh, and neglect from the normal level of where it just mm, normal pain of longing when we long for someone and we need them and we feel pain because we can't handle the whole thing of them but then my idea is that it's continuum of of pain it's not that on the one hand you raise the child and the child doesn't feel pain because as we'll see later maybe tomorrow maybe today um, you can discuss it that uh, this link uh, with the uh, according to Lieberman uh, this link is between children and uh, caregivers and later between those who we take who we care for is secured by by feeling of pain emotional pain there is no other way to find out if we need this person if we attach to the person uh, if you don't feel this this longing so longing is painful kind of already it might be not painful not that much pain but it's still pain um, so maybe abuse is uh, and neglect is um, too much pain but it's not the totally opposite of what should be considered healthy and the problem is that we if this definition of um, that started to be popular the idea that started to be popular that um, human uh, relationship especially a relationship with with infant that they have to be non -tra not traumatizing that you have to give especially vinicot idea that you have to give sacrifice all of yourself to to a caregiver to a child not to traumatize a child to satisfy all the needs of a child which is impossible and uh, when when you have this idea and then and you have to do it because otherwise it's your responsibility because you are responsible for a future uh, psychological development of a child and this is like basis for a child to provide this um, this care in a full amount and uh, yeah this is the idea of uh, for example where it comes from that mother have to stay a child that was taking care of a child and Winnicott never had children so he actually um, he, he only knew it from from the outside and he developed the whole idea of uh, that mother have to protect the child and satisfy all of their needs like fully from the outside so he had the idea that it can be not not painful there there are some harmonious perfect relationships um, with a child that are not um, well it, it was much better probably than uh, ideas before uh, vinicot and attachment theory the way children are treated but it's like it started to be turned out turned into the, the total um, the totally opposite thing that you have to before it was you don't you have to be strict with children or do not care not take that much care of them just children uh, they grow by themselves <laughs> and now um, starting with Vinicot uh, is uh, you have to like be uh, not a perfect but good enough uh, good enough parents and sacrifice a lot and uh, not to traumatize make sure that you will not traumatize the child mm, okay so we also remember yeah so uh, Hazan and Shaver they claim that romantic love the grown-up uh, love is also can be can be seen as based in Mm -hmm. this attachment process and we remember from lisa diamond that she claims again she based her uh, this thinking on the uh, shaver as well that i think that, that those are reproductive pair bonding in common sense terms and uh, romantic love they origin originally evolved not in the context of mating but in the context of uh, infant caregiver attachment so it's kind of here again the idea of Bowlby 
here and she claimed that because um, the basic thing uh, which is considered associated with love is sexuality romantic love uh, without sex is considered to be provocative like it's something that is weird is like failed uh, failed type of love because we still associate it not with just attachment which can in which the love can be can get admixed the i mean sexuality can get admixed as something secondary not the crucial thing uh, sexual relationship but uh, as the sublimation of love so uh, it is uh, like the 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 uh, the change totally changed version of um, uh, of what is provocative. It used to be provocative to have sex. Now it's provocative not to have sex. Now it's provocative to be uh, romantically in love with someone and not to not to have sex. But it's also, there are other researchers uh, who suggest that, um, who suggest that there are uh, not that much uh, not that much basis to actually consider that uh, romantic love or attachment in adults is based on sexual proximity. And according to Fanagi, we can see that uh, the fact that uh, sex can occur without attachment and that marriages without sex perhaps represent the majority of such part, uh, whatever. So the majority of uh, long-term relationship partners don't have sex. And they maybe they don't recognize it and we don't want to recognize it, but th those are so long-term relationship that uh, are considered, cons the people who consider themselves that they have successful relationship. So if they still are together and consider uh, themselves, uh, consider themselves as uh, having successful uh, relationship, they don't have sex, uh, right? So it maybe it's based not in a, and sex but on actually on something else so on this attachment that it's not deviation from sex and uh, according to some other research what people want from so the crucial um, crucial thing that people want from a relationship is uh, if they if their partner is caring enough so uh, someone who is able to take care and they also want, they are also interested in uh, in sexuality too but sexuality is never the key component of uh, what is considered to be uh, important in in relationship so the most important thing both for me, women and for men is that the partner is um, this lasting relationship is tender and uh, in taking care so sexual it's again if we come back to uh, freudian idea initial idea that there are two kinds of love the sensual the erotic and um, tender and that tender is basic one and it's always so we can see uh, that it always stay the basic as a basic one and erot erotic or sexual can only get um, get admixed to it and also yeah, so it's it's not that uh, tenderness and longing attachment is a deviation of sexual desire or suppression of sexual desire. It just exists by itself. It's the basic one. Otherwise, we should, if sexual is sexuality, pure sexuality, sexual desire is at the basis of uh, human proximity, we would um, we would have to consider rape as the true, like hardcore love, right? Just wasn't sublimated which doesn't make any sense because it's precisely psychologically traumatic because it uh, there is no tenderness like there is no this initial basis to which we can admix the sexual and uh, the sexual thing mm. yeah and we remember again from from last time that this is the uh, lisa diamond explanation that is based on other researchers that uh, brain dish for different brain system are involved in the uh, what we call love underlying love and sexual desire so uh, sexual desire is about androgens and estrogens and love is um, about oxytocin vasopressin but and dopamine and cort corticosterone so mostly researchers talk 
about uh, oxytocin and like define oxytocin as a hormone of love which initially served uh, within the evolution initially served the function of uh, connecting mother and and the child so enabling um, even the process of giving it involves it's involved in a process of uh, labor and in a process of breastfeeding uh, uh, yeah, that's why in, in experiments with oxytocin, women can't, um, mm, women are not allowed because it causes some processes um, that doesn't cause <laughs> in, in men. So oxytocin uh, experiments are done on, on men because it causes the contraction of, of a womb. So... Um, but we know that what secures the, the feeling of, of love, the way we associate it, uh, romantic love, what we associate it with is belonging um, to, to other person. And now, I think the, my favorite thing, <laughs> I really like uh, Matthew Rib Lieberman. Uh, he is a neuroscientist, socio-cognitive uh, neuroscientist. And you, uh, you have two sources, video with him and uh, his book to read uh, in your reading list. And he actually confirms in his find findings, uh, findings and uh, the basic idea of, um, of Bowlby and even radicalizes it, in it to a certain extent. Because he claims that um, we have, human have the... Uh, Human are radically social. We have this longing uh, for each other. So it's not just we are social and we need others. We are this uh, kind of a connection to other. That's how our brain function. And that's what defines us as, as humans. So he found out, and you probably will read about it in his book, uh, that during his experiment, that there is this basic mode of human brain and function of human brain that is pro-social and uh, for example uh, he claims that when we don't think about something if i'll tell you not to think about anything for a while so you will go into this basic mode of human uh, uh, basic mode of uh, your brain function and you will turn out to think about others so when you don't think about uh, anything when we ask not to think when we just not directing our um, our thoughts to a certain task we end up thinking about others about our relationship with with others uh, because others are the most psychologically important for us so it's um, what brains have to practice in thinking that this is what we consider the most important this is what we need to um, to hold in our brain mm. and the the other he also based his idea, <clears throat> same as um, same as Bowlby, that we are premature. Probably we are born premature, and to survive, we actually need to develop um, <clears throat> ability to get attached because from the other person, uh, our life uh, that we will survive de um, depends <clears throat> on the on the, our attachment to other person. He also. This is what Lieberman does. The Lieberman uh, inverts Maslow pyramid, but at the bottom of Maslow pyramid is uh, physiological needs, like need for food, need for shelter. That's the basic one. And we still associated that we wouldn't survive if uh, we don't have food, and we don't have shelter. Uh, and love and belonging is only third on the top. So it's not that necessary in comparison with physiological, but Lieberman claims that they are also actually for humans and they are the basic one. Even uh, for survival, for physical survival, you need to be fed by someone. So to be fed by someone and to be taken care of by someone, you need to, um, you need to, they need to be attached to you, you and you need, you need to uh, be able to get attached for them to ask for help. So this, this basic um, couple of caregiver child uh, is um, what defines human. 
And uh, we know, for example, from, I think we already know about ourselves that if we try to, so the other people are those that are the most uh, important to us. And what secures, uh, this is where we can talk, start talk about pain, to secure the bond between uh, between people, between caregiver and child, uh, we have, we developed the ability of what uh, Lieberman calls the social pain. So we feel, we are able to feel social pain and this social pain, like when we are, mm, uh, for example, when someone who we loved die or we, when we, um, when we are humiliated on, in front of others, on, when we are dumped, by someone who we love, we feel uh, we feel uh, social pain, so we feel rejected, and this pain actually uh, so our ability to have this social pain was developed in the course of evolution. Means it has a certain function. It has a function to secure um, a social social bond, and uh, it's even sometimes we think that it's not serious thing the, the social pain that if if something really hurts like when we we broke our when we broke our when we break in our leg or something that's like real physical pain but um matthew and his research team discovered that it's also the social pain is also the new brain is a real kind of a pain and he even claims that if you you are asked to recollect the most painful memory the most traumatic memory of, of your life, you will unlikely uh, think about like that you once broke. You will think about someone you lost, someone you loved and uh, you lost that person or when you were humiliated. So some rejection, some, some social pain. And this, we feel it, it's also physical. It involves a very similar mechanism, neurological, neurobiological mechanism as a physical pain, pain of physical body. And same, or by analogy, with a physical a pain of a physical body, it developed within the course of evolution. So we would pay attention to what hurts, right? When the part of our body hurts, it means it signalizes us that we have to pay attention to it, to you know, to do something with it. And same, uh, so not exactly same, but still, when something hurts on social level within our social body of, as a result of rejection, either humiliation or someone dies uh, or someone dumps us, it also means, signalizes that we need to pay attention to this. We, this, is, this person is important. We need to fix it. We need to fix this bone, which is um, kind of tragical need. It cannot be satisfied because we die, right? There's someone, we, people die. So people get dumped, people get humiliated. We, um, and uh, that's why we are vulnerable. And the, the, um, we might think that uh, one day we might get rid of the social pain and be happy, and, but it doesn't work that way because we only feel uh, the proximity as the, this longing as pain, right? It, this pain secures um, our, our proximity with other and we feel happiness only secondary only when this pain is uh, reduced as a reduction of pain but pain is um, at least in certain amount is is necessary for that because it actually secures the the proximity the longing to each other and Lieberman claims that th there are people who are born with the uh, they are not able from the from the birth uh, from from the start to feel pain, physical pain. And uh, lots of them don't actually survive for that long because they keep injuring themselves. And they can't, they can't, they never develop the ability to protect themselves. So uh, those children, it's not rare that they die. And for, for Lieberman, by analogy, uh, the social pain is, is important because it secures something that is uh, important for important for us so our basic uh, basic whatever connectivity with uh, with others and for for Lieberman more than for Bowlby uh, he claimed that it's not only so he claimed that we are born with this ability to connect with others with this need to connect with others 
with the with the ability to feel pain because someone we are attached to uh, does not fully belong to us and uh, we never grow up uh, fully we never change so this uh, basic mode of our basic mode of uh, how our brain functions and that is based on so social we actually think about others uh, when we don't think about something precise it's not only about children it's uh, about human being as such so we always stay infantile in in this way and we can also think about basic interconnectivity in he in in this respect because um, because um, for for Lieberman, he still he still uh, kind of exists within the Freudian perspective, not only Freudian perspective. He, he is the he he is someone who is maybe can be considered as stepping out of this perspective, but still he is still mm, by the very definition of um, of the need was for proximity of ability to get attached of individuality he still actually exists within the same perspective as freud existed in terms that freud considered human being as um, as egoistic as someone who uh, exists initially detached from the others and then uh, attachment comes as secondary as uh, as as the satisfaction of a need for proximity so it's still personal need it's still we start with individual the in, in satisfaction of individual needs for for freud it was individual need for sexuality that uh, is longing for pleasure so we want to feel pleasure that's why we are longing for others and for lieberman is better because he claims that um, we have the need for proximity with others and uh, we feel pain it's secured by pain but it's still um, so sometimes in uh, at certain point uh, Lieberman claims that um, because of these findings that our brains are initially social like social at the basis it starts with sociality does it and then we can so individuality here can be seen as a, as a secondary phenomena so it first sociality it's first interconnectivity of brains and only uh, then appears individuality and it's never individual as such it's same as Winnicott claimed that there is no such thing as a baby he, we can also say that there is no such thing as individual individual is when when if our brain is profoundly social and it's basically social we never exist as totally separate egoistic creature we only exist as as um, as a point within a net of connected brains of connected uh, not maybe not only brains but bodies as well we're giving birth to each other right so we are all even physically connected in in certain extent and now by the way the part of this connectivity is not only uh, not only by uh, genes and stuff like that but also horizontal like virus connects us to it's um, it's not part of so it starts to be part of our uh, of our nature it changes our it might kill us as well but it changes um, so our bodies and we can um, it spreads from a human to human it's it's still a part of our connectivity like it's, it's terrible side of it but it's still um, we can think about all the phenomena from this different perspective of you not starting with individual separated from others but uh, and that's why we are separated now from from each other so not to spread this thing because not to connect in this way but um yeah so this perspective that lieberman suggests is actually changes a lot he still see the uh, social need as a need of individual so he still starts with individual like there is individual there is his need or her need and then the other person because individual acts on the basis of this need the other person get attached to her but we can think the other way around that it starts with sociality with interconnectivity without individual 
and then individual appears but it also uh, appears not as the opposite to social body but as a kind of manifestation of it there is I probably told you that there is this theory that considers uh, individual the appearance of uh, of individual consciousness within the evolution as uh, for the reason so it appeared for the reason that it was more uh, more functional cooperation it secured the more uh, better way of cooperating of people with with each other so we can see we understand we we have the idea that we exist as a separate individual because this is a better version of sociality it's a, it's a kind of a version of uh, individuality is the way to make sociality more efficient right it's still it's not the opposite it's just the more efficient way of of sociality and uh, Lieberman actually opposes his thinking to uh, the way he defines uh, what he defines the common thinking what F Freud manifests is that we humans are egoistic and uh, so children, babies are egoistic and separated humans. Sometimes Freud actually contradicts himself, claiming that the child doesn't know itself as a child, as individual, and they don't comprehend themselves as such. But still, um, within his theory, uh, it turns that way that uh, children start from egoistic need so the sexual the sexual need is egoistic need that's why i don't like this sexuality the discourse of sexuality that kept that is that colonizes the idea of love and proximity because it's egoistic even though it doesn't make sense because if you think about sexual longing it's not that bad it connects people but somehow within psychoanalysis it's still egoistic need how it can be egoistic if it's if it's the need if it's something that connects if it's something that is supposed to end in physical proximity, but somehow the way it's in, in psychoanalysis, formulated in psychoanalysis, is just satisfaction. So it connects us, but it's like not important. The important thing is our egoistic satisfaction. And no one pays attention to these connections because this sexuality thinks <laughs> they did it totally wrong from the beginning. So, um, and I have no problems with defining, um, with maybe seeing uh, sex, sexuality, sexual longing in this term, in this uh, sense as uh, longing to each other, but still for Freud, it's not so. And it's hard to redefine it in a way that it's about connectivity, not about satisfaction of egoistic desires. And even for mother, even for uh, mother, we know that according to uh, Freud, the baby infant is just a substitution of her egoistic desire of penis. And the child is uh, considered as a part of her, that why she's taking care of, of a child as of herself. So it's when you start with egoistic, when you just presuppose as a hypothesis that everything is egoistic, you can of course interpret it in this way, but why? I mean, if there is other, other way to interpret it. And the last thing I wanted to say is, um, is this research that I found out about. Uh, it was made three years ago, I think in 2017, in Cambridge University in this lab. So what they did, they measured um, they measured uh, brain activity of a mother and a child using some cool technologies and when they are uh, when they are operating in tandem so uh, when they are interacting with each other and it turned out that uh, well amazingly uh, we have except for uh, except for our brain function and as individual uh, brain so in inter um, Mm. as a separate brain it can also it can also function as um uh so as ne as a part of the network as um working together as a certain unit so when we cooperate with someone we actually we do physically connect we have except for uh, ne neuronal activity that is just inside the brain it can also be synchronized with the other person. Yeah. 
uh, starting from the uh, from our very young age and be um, and we can function as a certain certain unit so we have not only interpersonal but uh, mm, interpersonal uh, neural neural connectivity and normally when we think about our brains we think about our brains as something separate as something that is um, maybe according to Lieberman is interested in connecting with others can feel the uh, is aimed at connection with others but we are actually connected so our our brain can be synchronized they can actually function as a certain um, as a certain unit certain uh, network not as a single unit so and the, this research is uh, you can you you have to see i like their heads a lot they're very stylish so this research is only able we would only able to to conduct this research when we already see uh, so we uh, this is research on interconnectivity if you if you don't understand that it exists we don't even know what to um, do research on so it's like a next step in claiming that we have need for others but maybe we are others so there are no us there are this this idea of uh, we and of us me is uh, you and you are me so the researcher Victoria Leon as the, the main researcher of this project. She claims the degree of connectivity inside a single brain re reflects how freely and efficiently information flows, flows from one area in the brain to another. So we really do function. It's not only mother and child. This is, the, this is how our brain starts, right? This is how our... Um, uh, education starts how we come to this world or to this world because they function in uh, our brains are synchronized with a caregiver with someone we are cooperating with we are synchronized we function as the as a network and it, this actually exists all our lives this is how we form the the proximity with others so in, we can define probably love as well as the synchronization as we really physically become one mm, with with others including that who we are is the uh, our synchronization of the caregiver so we are complex and we kind of the complex that can uh, that gets uh, different forms so yeah, we still have 10 minutes or something if you have any question we can discuss otherwise i will show you the continuum of, of reproduction again to, to talk about it so the idea of love here that i wanted to represent is that um, yeah i promise you to talk about this ten ten and uh, the certainly kite so uh, initially when freud freud claimed that it's about uh, this first current of love, a tender, uh, certainly the one that has to do with the tenderness and the other one get admixed, the sensual one get admixed to the initial current. So it's turned out that uh, so unfortunate for Freud who actually had this idea and started to develop totally crazy different, <laughs> different idea and that start to be popular and define the way we think about ourselves until uh, now. But he's this basic idea that it's tender current that is uh, that is basic current uh, in and it's get admixed so actually the word zärtlichkeit uh, is an tenderness in english and in german they are both um, derived from so they have to do with children tender mean um, yes tender means it's about something about infants something about uh, something about babies and it's it's never, and we also uh, recently get rid of the idea that uh, adults are in a way totally different from children. For example, we know that we uh, have brain plasticity all our, throughout all our lives. It's not that children are formed and then 
are in a process of formation, then they are certainly formed and they are adults. They can't change uh, anymore. So now we know that it maybe it's more intense during childhood, this process, but um, adulthood is not opposite to, to childhood in this way. We are still plastic, we're still changeable. And same with, um, same with this startling guide that Freud claimed that is uh, about children and uh, adults, if they want to be uh, adults, and they have to admit the reality of sexuality. And woman, if she requires uh, tenderness, is uh, Freud considered as a hysterical symptom. So as not fully developed, doesn't woman who doesn't admit the whole reality of uh, sexuality. So it's Freud in this, in this uh, case preserves the idea of um, that adults are mm, in a way different from the from children but also Freud as a friend as our friend not our enemy uh, have has the idea that well all the sexuality human sexuality is totally perversed as we saw from Alien Kazupanchi for example so it stay perverse to the end so he he has both contradicting uh, contradicting ideas here so if he claim that it's perverse and that uh, tenderness is is a perversion is underdeveloped sexuality we can also we can so at the same time we can see in freud that uh, we stay children we have the need for tenderness so we are infantile right um, all our lives but at, at the same time he has the he still preserves this contradicting idea to the first one that uh, we are uh, Adults, we are something opposite to children, like we are normal. Mm, and yeah, so do you have questions? No. Okay, what, what shall I talk about then? I can uh, let you go a bit early if you want. Or let's discuss if you have any problems with, with essay and I switched there recording off.